Hey everyone, in this video we're going to talk about the Bradford White Aerotherm heat pump water heater and kind of go in depth onto some of the problems I've had with this unit and uh, why I don't recommend it. So stay tuned for that. Alright, so if you're familiar with heat pump water heaters, you know they basically operate on the principle they have a heat pump up top that takes the heat from the room where it's in and puts it down in, into the tank, into the water. And they also have backup resistive elements. Uh, those are just the same kind of elements a regular electric water heater would have, kind you might see, similar to what you'd see inside your oven. So, um, in principle, these are really great. And I like heat pump water heaters generally. Um, this actually isn't my first heat pump water heater. So, the way this one has been operating, I think, has been especially peculiar, knowing how heat pump water heaters can operate um, and how they, how they can work really, really well. But unfortunately, this one hasn't. So, so let's get into what the problems are. So this is a 65-gallon unit, and we have a house of three, uh, three people here. And we have kind of moderate usage. We don't have take really long showers or anything like that. We have low flow shower heads, low flow this and that. So we're not using a ton of water, um, but uh, everybody is showering in the evening at some point, although not back to back. So there's there's kind of some some demand, but it's not absolutely massive. So what happens? is, you know, once you get to the second or the third shower in the evening, you know, sometimes you'll notice the water just isn't that hot. And that's kind of peculiar because I have this set uh, to 140 degrees, and I have a mixing valve installed as well. And the idea with that is this having especially hot water in the tank allows you to have a little bit more hot water overall because this really hot water gets mixed at the mixing valve with some cooler water to make it usable for your for your shower for washing dishes or whatever. So the problem we're seeing then, yeah, is that the we're getting kind of cool showers, not cold, but not really warm enough to where it's comfortable. So what's so peculiar about that is like I said, I previously had a heat pump water heater in this very spot, in this house, with pretty much the same usage patterns and the same people living here, everything like that. And the way that one worked, when the water got cold enough in the tank and the heat pump was running, it would kick on the resistive elements to help boost up the temperature and keep the water at a comfortable comfortable temperature. Um, this one, I don't understand the logic of when and why it uh, kicks on the electric elements. I've seen sometimes, I come down here, and on the Bradford White, you can go into a diagnostic menu if you hold the up and the enter, and it'll bring up here the uh, tank temperature, which currently is, is hot. It's, it just got done uh, finishing heating up, so we're at 139 right now, and that's, that's pretty good. That's fine, but I've seen this number as low as 104 degrees, and when, mind you, that's when this is set to 140 uh, desired temperature. So, at 104 degrees, you would expect that you'd be running the resistive elements to try and kind of bring the water back up to temperature. But it doesn't do that on any kind of consistent basis. It does sometimes, but not consistently. And that's just really a head-scratcher for me why it would do that. And so I think the, the question obviously arises then, is there something wrong with this unit? Uh, something malfunctioning that's causing this? And I thought maybe that was true too. So I've, I've had numerous calls with Bradford White Tech Support, and I've actually had a person come out here, a qualified technician, who speci especially works on heat pump water heaters, came out, spent two, three hours, ran a bunch of tests. The only thing that didn't quite past muster was there's a temperature sensor, which I guess is this T2 sensor here um, at the top of the tank, that supposedly didn't pass. And that was replaced. Um, it has a new part, and it didn't really change anything. It's still doing what it does. So I'm left 
to the conclusion that this thing is working, it's operating as it, as it should be, as it was designed, but I'm wondering why it was designed the way it was. So, I just don't understand why there wouldn't be a hard floor where, let's say, the T2 temperature, what you're seeing, which is the temperature at the top of the tank, when that gets down to, let's say, 120, or basically about 20 degrees below whatever the set point you have it at, why wouldn't it then kick on the electric elements, you know, at a, at a temperature? Um, the only way this, I've seen, kicks on the electric elements is when it detects high demand, which is kind of a nebulous thing. It just, I'm, I'm guessing it's when this T2 temperature drops a certain number of degrees in a certain amount of time. So, with our low flow shower heads, that doesn't happen very often. We don't see large draws where the water is depleted quickly. So, it becomes kind of a frog in boiling water situation where this it gets lower and lower and lower, um, but the way the programming is set up on this, it just won't kick on the resistive elements and we get kind of cold showers as a result. Um, and that's frankly just unacceptable. I, this is not a cheap unit. This costs uh, approximately $2,400 uh, when I had it installed, not including the labor to install it. So, again, having previous experience with heat pump water heaters and having one that didn't have this problem at all, and in fact, the previous one I had was only 50 gallons, this is 65, and it was better able to respond to our, our needs and the demands of the house. So, it's, it's really frustrating that, that this one just doesn't cut the mustard. So, the other problem we have is sometimes the it will kick into high demand at times when it probably doesn't need to. And so we kind of have the worst of both worlds because when it kicks into high demand, it does kick on the electric elements. And the way this one works is it'll keep the elements on until you get the temperature satisfied to whatever the set point is. So on the previous one, it would just kick it on to bump it up and have the heat pump finish the rest of the heating cycle. So. This one will use a lot of energy on those, on those high demand, when it thinks there's high demand, which isn't very often, but it does happen. <clears throat> so, I'm just questioning why is this? Why does it do this? Well, I've been observing this unit now for a long time. It's, it's been in my house now for over a year, so I've had a lot of time to check it. And, the, I think it's important to point out it's really only an issue in the winter time when our incoming water is cold. So the incoming water temperature here um, in like January is about 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty cold. Um, and it's understood that it's going to use more energy and it's going to take longer to recover. That's, that's okay. That's just par for the course of any water heater, no matter how it's designed, how it's fueled or, or whatever. Um, but the issue I see is, well, if you remember, I said there's no hard set point on when the resistive elements come on. There does seem to be a hard set point on when the heat pump comes on. So the heat pump uh, tends to come on pretty much only when it's 11 degrees below the set point. So when I have it set at 140, it has the, te the temperature at the top of the tank has to get down to 129 before it kicks on the heat pump. So when the water, when the incoming water is cold, that means it has a large hill to climb and it's kind of already behind. It's, it's already, you know, late to the, to the starting gun. Because um, this unit, again, is unique in that it appears to only have one temperature sensor. Every other heat pump water heater on the market that I'm aware of has two temperature sensors for the tank. For the tank specifically, not looking at the compressor or anything like that. There's usually one on the top and there's either one on the bottom or they have some way of averaging the entire temperature of the tank. So either way is fine, but this only knows what's going on up here 
on top. And in those cold months, what I think is happening is we got the really cold water coming in, and cold water is a lot more dense than hot water. So the cold water comes in, goes into the dip tube, which, which uh, releases the water down at the bottom of the tank, which is good, and pretty much all water heaters are designed that way because it's, it's a good idea. Um, but the problem is this is kind of flying blind then because we've got really, really cold water down at the bottom, but up top we're still, you know, let's say 132 degrees. So the water temperature uh, in any other heat pump water heater, the uh, sensor for the lower one would say, ooh, there's a lot of cold water in here. Let's get the heat pump going. Let's start warming it up because we know it's, we're just going to need more time to heat up. But this one, just because it only has one sensor, it only has this T2, and there's no T1, which I find interesting. There's a T3B, T3A, T2, but no T1. And I wonder if maybe there used to be a T1 and they said, well, we can save a few bucks and, and not include that. So if that's true, and I have no knowledge if that's true or not, uh, that is a pretty big oversight in the design of this unit. Uh, because effectively it means that this really only operates well uh, when the incoming water is, is warmer, say above, I don't know, 50 or 55 degrees. Um, in, in this slow, colder climate here, um, when the incoming water is cold, it's just, it's not getting it done. So it's just been, it's really frustrating because I don't understand why they wouldn't consider that some people have cold incoming water. It, it kind of seems like they didn't. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, I've had a lot of conversations with Bradford White Tech Support, and I, I'm not an engineer or anything like that, but I, you know, I have some curiosity about how things work and why things are the way they are. So I kind of pressed them and I said, well, why did you design it this way? Why, why do you not have it have some kind of intelligence? Because the other thing they could do is they could have an intelligence where it says, whoa, if, um, if the previous 24 hours showed that the water temperature in the tank got really, really cold, maybe we shouldn't wait until 11 degrees below the set point to kick on the heat pump. Um, you know, there's lots of ways you could design that. And I'm not a software expert either, but, but I know it can be done. And um, they, they didn't have a lot of good answers for me. The, the tech support was, was frustrating. I talked to a bunch of different people. I talked to one person who told me that the electric elements kicked on at 11 degrees below the set point, which we know isn't true. Um, and then I, you know, followed up, and this was by email, and he just ghosted, and I never heard from him. Um, I called on the phone, and I talked to a second person who said, well, there can't be, you know, if there's no air codes, there can't be anything wrong with this. There's something wrong with your house. You have a bad mixing valve or something. And so just to entertain that idea, I did test our mixing valve, and I can see, because I know what the temperature is in the tank, I actually have a utility sink where uh, it is upstream of the mixing valve, so I can get basically the really, really hot water out of here at that utility sink over there and see what's, what's the temperature and then I could see downstream of the mixing valve, basically everywhere else in the house, what's the temperature. And the mixing valve is working fine. It's, it's set at about 120, and I've seen it at a range 120, 122. It's working fine. Um, the shower valve, that's another thing they said. Maybe the shower valve is bad. I've replaced the shower valve. Um, it's not. It's fine. Anytime this number is high, we have hot water up there. It's fine. Um, there just isn't anything wrong with our house's plumbing in terms of somewhere that the hot water would be disappearing or something like that. And I, I don't know, you know, if they just weren't well trained or what, but they, they, you know, were throwing out all these things, and then they, you know, I, I said I had an answer for everything of why it probably wasn't that, and I. I was just trying to understand how this works, and they said, well, we can't diagnose this over the phone. I wasn't asking for them to diagnose this over the phone. I was trying to understand how 
this works. Like, how is it supposed to work? And if I can observe how it's working out here, and something isn't right, isn't the way it's supposed to be, then I can say, oh, well, then we might have a problem. We need, you know, software update, control replacement, whatever. I don't know what the solution would be. Um, and the the tech support, they, they got on the expert, uh, the kind of guy who tells you how many years of experience he has and thinks he's like the smartest guy in the room. And I kept wanting to have a discussion and he kept interrupting me and it was just, it was not a good experience. I mean, you know, you can think your customers are, are nuts or whatever. It's okay to think you, you have a nuts customers, but you don't. You don't be rude to them, you don't cut them off or, or anything like that. And it was just a really, really poor experience. So I ended up complaining uh, to higher ups at Bradford White, which I don't like to do. I know customer service is a tough job. It's something I've done and, and I really, really don't like to do that. But this was just so over the top. And I did finally get a third person who was much more receptive to working with me to try and figure out what's wrong and that's how we got a technician sent out here just to you know check it out and make sure everything's okay um, or if it's not then we can fix something um, but you know at the end of the day they nothing was physically wrong with this and they don't have a fix they're not going to provide any kind of software update or any kind of change to this unit that would make it work better in my setup. So that was disappointing because you know I, I bought this with high hopes. This is made by my fellow Midwesterners. You know I really, Bradford White if you don't know, they're kind of a, a David to the Goliaths of the plumbing industry of A.O. Smith or Ream or whoever. Um, they're, they're much much smaller and you know you, you kind of root for the little guy but it just it was not a good experience. So what I ended up doing, because they basically told me there's no fix for this, there's there's nothing to be done to, to improve this problem, I ended up just asking for a full refund of both the price of the unit and the, the labor to install it, which was pretty substantial, as you might imagine. And after, you know, some couple days, they thought, and they did finally agree to that. So... To their credit, I, I am at least getting my money back, and I am going to be replacing this here very shortly with with a new unit, which uh, I'm making a companion video to this one. Um, so I'm going to have a review of, unfortunately, every water heat pump water heater I've had here because I've gone through a few uh, due to various reasons, and uh, we're going to make the best of that and, and kind of talk about how they work and in an actual real world thing rather than just reading a spec sheet because if you just read the spec sheet if you look at the energy guide down here this should be great this should be t just fine for my usage but for for many reasons unfortunately it isn't um, so I discovered if again if you know a little bit about the history of heat pump water heaters you know Bradford White actually was uh, got this design this basic design from GE. GE had something called the Geospring heat pump water heater. And GE ended up getting out of the business. Um, and they basically, they sold the tooling and the technology and everything like that to Bradford White. So Bradford White continues to build what are essentially GE Geospring units, which probably have some changes and differences. And GE, this, as I said, this is 65 gallon. GE never had a 65 gallon, they had a 50 and an 80, so um, this is kind of a wholly Bradford White creation. Um, it's uh, not something that we could directly say, oh, GE came up with that. But the, the, the last thing I, I want to mention that kind of supports that this experience isn't really an anomaly is after the fact, just in the uh, relatively recently, um, I discovered that the U.S. Department of Department of Energy uh, did a study about 10 years ago or a little more on heat pump water heaters and they bought a whole bunch of them and they installed them in homes I think in the Pacific Northwest where in, in a part of the Pacific Northwest where it does get fairly cold in the winter and they 
ask the homeowners, you know, how, how did it work? Uh, were you happy? Did you have enough hot water? Did the noise bother you? That kind of thing. And most of the units, they, they had a whole bunch of different brands, um, including the GE Geospring. And the only one where people complained about either, a, a, a significant number of people complained about not enough hot water, or that the energy bill was higher than they thought it should be, was GE. And I'm going to link. Uh, I'm going to link to that study in the description of this video, so you can take a look and you can see. Um, unfortunately, I think this is just the way these things are, and this probably works fine in Florida because it worked fine for me in the summer. All through the summer, when the incoming water is warmer, um, this runs 100% heat pump, just fine. No issues with hot water. No high energy usage. Anything like that. Um, but in the cold weather, in the colder climates, and here in the Midwest in the winter, this unit just, I wouldn't recommend it, unfortunately. Um, and I kind of regret buying it, knowing what I know now. But I wanted to share this with, with you guys so you know, um, you know just about this and to be aware. Um, do you have any experience with GE Geospring or Bradford White? I'd love to hear about it. Um, if you want to let me know in the comments, tell me about your experience, good, bad, neutral, whatever. Um, but I think that's going to do it for this video, so uh, thank you so much for watching, and if you could give it a thumbs up, I'd really appreciate it. Take care.